So welcome to another episode of the What Goes On podcast. This week we have, um, uh, well, Mr. Mike Venart of uh, many things, of Ocean Size, live guitarist for Biffy Cairo, does the whole Venart thing now, just released a new album and um, maker of some of the best guitar sounds out there. It's like Yay. a teacher of fuzz. I love it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, like an actual, I mean, I, an actual guitar hero of mine. So, oh, give you up. You're, you're playing shits all over me, man. Come on, I've no, seen. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm just, I mean, I told you when I when we first met, I wasn't that familiar with Ocean Size at that time, and then mm. kind of started listening to it. And then when you brought out um, Demon Joke was the first one, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, it's just the sonics on it are insane. This, you know, nice, it's, it's, it's really, really. I tried cool. to make that one sound especially shit. I've got. I'm sl- they're already like I've spoken twice and I've swore twice. That's not a good ratio. Mm. So I'll uh, I'll try and tone it down. <laughs> nice. Do we need a virtual swear box. I know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, a little donation button. Bing. <laughs> yeah, that would be good. <laughs> can I can I just say though, demon joke? That was I I hadn't listened to any ocean size. I'm not even sure that I'd heard you playing with Biffy. Right. Um, and was never really into kind of metal when I was a kid, but Demon Joke was amazing. Well, thank you. I had no idea. And I, I, yeah, I think I, I possibly emailed you about it and just like all of the, it's so evocative of something that I couldn't put my finger on. I feel it felt like when I was doing my A-levels and I was, I was in another country in, a, in Cyprus doing my A-levels, but I was sitting in this sweaty room and just these kind of echoes of sitting in the room at 19 just kept on coming back while I was listening to that record. I listened to if if I could have listened to it until it wore out as an MP3, then I would <laughs> I would have worn the MP3s out. Oh, so, that's yeah. really kind, Steve. That's one of the best compliments I've ever had because I think like some of my favourite bands, like Mogwai, for example, they're to me a really evocative band. They sort of mm. they, they 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 take me to somewhere else that I feel like I've forgotten long ago. You know. Yeah. Um, and I, I love that that music can do that. It's pure magic in it when it just yeah. sort of mm. trans transports you and transforms your entire mindset. Yeah. Uh, nobody's ever said that before. Well, of course, yeah, probably. I just try not to listen. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> as it is. It's a, there's a there's a German expression. And I'm going to butcher it. I think, and I may this may be completely wrong. It's Seinsucht, I think. Oh yeah. And it's it means yearning after something, and you don't really know what it is. That's kind of that's what I get from your music. I think I'm writing that down, man. Seinsucht. I think that's Sein right. Sucht. German, the Germans, they have words for everything. They have a word they, for they everything, do it, don't they? It's amazing. Only the Germans could have come up with sh- shout, shout and frown. Shout, shout and frown. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, they've they've got there's a word I can't remember what it actually is, but literally literally translated, um, it's dragon fruit. And what it is, it's a word. It's the gifts that you buy your partner when you after you've annoyed them to say sorry. <laughs> oh, brilliant man! <laughs> yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's a good one. I can't remember where I found that out, but anyway, that, we, we've got whenever we're touring Germany, it feels fantastic, and we have a catchphrase for it: Germany. It just works. Everything <laughs> they've got it all down. You know, every, like clockwork. There'll be more beer when fridge runs dry. Yeah. The Wi-Fi will be bleachingly fast, and it never turns off. They've got all the cheeses that you like. Everything, and you know that it is autumn. <laughs> <laughs> Cheese, beer, and Wi-Fi. It doesn't get much better, does it? A is a touring <laughs> band. You fucking don't need all else, just good electricity. Um, so your 60 cycle um don't start fucking about with you. Can I swear on it? You can bleep me out anyway, can't you? That's fine. Yeah. You know, don't worry. <laughs> There's no way I'm gonna get through this without swearing. That's all good. So when when did music first become a thing for you? When did you when did it sort of spark something? Um one of my earliest memories, I won't I, I can't remember which band came first but it was the police or adamant or both at the same time 
And my mum didn't used to read me a bedtime story. She used to read me the police fan club magazine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Telling me what, you know, fucking Andy Summers' favourite colour is. To get me off to sleep. <laughs> um, and, you know, I was, I was just into music. I loved dressing up as Adamant when I was, you know, I guess fucking six or something like that. Yeah. Uh, I remember coming home and say, cause the, the girl over the road had painted my face up all like Adamant. And I came home and told her, Mom, apparently all I need to do now is dye me hair black and have it permed. And she's like, really? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, that's all. all. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be straight down cast tomorrow and get that sorted for you, mate. <laughs> um, but no, it wasn't until, sort of, um, I guess, 1983, 1984, I got really into status quo through my older brother. Mm. And just had this weird man crush on Rick Parfit. Just the fucking blonde hair, the battered Telecaster. He never played any leads or anything, but his fucking strumming hand was like a fucking machine gun, man. It was just, ah. Yeah. Oh. I just loved him. And he was all sweaty in his satin shirt. I was like, whoa, fucking <laughs> brilliant. Um, and, so, and then my first ever gig was status quo in 1984 in Brillington. On their farewell tour, by the way. Wow. <laughs> farewell tour in 1984. Uh, I then went to see and their, their next farewell tour in 2014. Which is great <laughs> also. I was saying goodbye. <laughs> yeah, the, the relentless goodbye. <laughs> yeah, oh. just like into the distance. Like <laughs> no, I just, I, I, I think it was always going to be guitar, you know, it just... Yeah. I, I think every kid wants to be a drummer at some point, you know, but that, mm. that just weren't going to happen. My mum and dad weren't fucking ever going to have that. No, nah. it's a noisy thing. <laughs> it's a noisy thing. And it, it's, yeah, it, I mean, to this day, you know, the lad who plays drums for me, Denzel, he's not got a drum kit at his house, so he struggles to find somewhere to go and, you know, practice, get get stuff together. And it's just, what, what a nightmare that must be, you know. Yeah. I only stopped playing guitar to fucking eat my tea or something, you know what I mean? It's yeah. like... I've just got a guitar on me all the time. If I couldn't do that, it's like when, when we're touring with Biffy, we'll fly in to wherever it is. When I get there, I've got to be in a hotel room until the next day when the gig is. And I won't have a guitar for like 24 hours at a time. So I'll be like ringing up the production manager going, has the truck tipped yet? And he's like, oh, it's fucking not. The gig's tomorrow. I'm like, Aah. Just want a guitar all the time. It's like I imagine it's like what stopping smoking is like, you know, when yeah. you're fucking craving a cig all the time. I end up sitting in my hotel room looking at pictures of guitars that are like mine. <laughs> Just imagining <laughs> oh. it's like a strange sort of cyber sex. Yeah. You know, like, oh that's what I do to that guitar. <laughs> <laughs> Man, pro properly got you. <laughs> oh, it's strange, man. Still the same. Always been the same. When did you start? When did, did you, you draw start? pictures of? Did you draw pictures of schools uh, of guitars when you were at school on your exercise book? Always, yeah, yeah. Um, strats are just not very easy to draw, though. Yeah, that, weird. I was always a strat man at school, you know, which was handy because, like, left-handed wise, you weren't going to get anything else really. Mm. Um, being left-handed was always. Well, when I was a kid, it was a bit of a handicap because I don't know, it it spilled over into other areas of my psyche where it was like, because I couldn't go into a guitar shop and look at any guitars, mm. it, it, it felt like that was every part of my life. So I had to remind myself that it was okay to go and look and look at trainers because yeah. I could buy trainers. But there was a part of my brain was like, what's the point? You can get, you know. You left handed, you're like, <laughs> really weird, really weird. But that, it, yeah, it was so. Yeah, I got I, I started playing when I was I started beating around on my brother's right handed acoustic when I was six, mm. and then I got my first electric when I was seven. And it was right handed. I, I tried to like because the guy in the shop says he's not he's not going to have any joy playing left handed, should just learn the other way around. Tried to sort of convince me it was a it was like a piano. And yeah. the both hands are equally important, which I, I you know, I, when I, in my mind, I'll say that I tried for a week to do it. I tried for a fucking minute to do it. Yeah. I decided, no way, no way. 
Yeah, my 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 son's left-handed and he's he plays guitar now, but he pick he picked it up and automatically played it right-handed. Right. And then I had a a, cus, a customer came in and uh, he was left-handed and I was chatting to him about it and he, he, apparently there's two different types of left-handed. There's one where you're completely 100% left-handed and you can't do anything the other way and then there's one where it's kind of you've still got a bit yeah. a bit of it i don't know i can't remember exactly how yeah he... my, my vic is a little bit like that he mm -hmm. he can he writes with his left hand when he holds a guitar against his will it'll be <laughs> left-handed but he does a lot of other things with his right my right hand i, I could take or leave it it does fuck all yeah. i do threaten with it but i don't do anything else with it it's just yeah. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> it's, so weird. it's like it's somebody else's fucking hand i'm useless with it <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm trying to think whether I do anything with my left. I I do because I when I'm soldering, I I can actually maybe yeah, I can hold solder and something else all in my left hand and then move them towards each other. Right. The so that I can solder things. So actually, yeah. So that's my, my left hand has been forced into that. Doesn't really make it should be the other way around, really. Because mm. that then my left hand has got to do a lot more work than the hand with the soldering iron. So, so you're right hand. Yeah. yeah. I only know that. I'm right handed. Your, uh, yeah. Your Mustang that looked really great. <laughs> oh, the pink one. Yeah, man. Yeah. I love it. Oh, man. That. Oh, my God. Look at that. Oh, it's outrageous. <laughs> I've already dinged it as well. Look at that. It's oh, good. yeah. The blue is coming man. through already. Right. Oh, yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, it's yeah. And that one. Oh, amazing. It's so cool. cool. That's <laughs> we sprayed it we sprayed it with graffiti paint which oh, um, really? Yeah, it's it's really good. Actually I've sprayed I've started um I, sp I spray everything pretty much given half a chance. <laughs> <laughs> like a cat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. <laughs> with like green typically it's green or pink paint. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So when did you when did you start like com like well composing your own stuff like making things or did you always do it or no no I never I was never a writer until I formed my first band and um, that was a band called Goon which was at uh, Salford Uni I met Steve DeRose from Ocean Size and I met. Uh, John Ellis, he was also in that band. John Ellis was the original bass player in Ocean Size. And so I was just thrown. But also what, what is part of this is that um, when I was living in Methley, sort of near Castleford in West Yorkshire, um, it was fucking stupid enough that I was a guitar player. Nobody was impressed. Mm. Nobody was like, oh, he's cool. Let's all sleep with him. <laughs> Every, it, it was just like, it was that like fucking weird. I might as well have been walking dressed, walking around dressed like Alice Cooper, you know what I mean? It was like, right, okay. <laughs> so I, um, I, I wanted to be a singer as well. And I thought, in you know, privately, I, could, I thought I could sing a bit. Uh, but I would never have come out as a singer in that place. Because, like I say, it was just like, I'm fucking, I think, yeah, I fucking puffed her. You know, yeah. just pure... Brexitsville. So I like I um when I moved to Manchester, Salford, I just went round telling everybody I was a singer. Right. Mm. As if like, well then nobody'll know. And so I started getting these singing gigs. Uh and I formed my own band, started writing songs with, with that. And that led to Ocean Size. Um and to be quite honest, I didn't really write any songs at all until I went out on my own. Really? I, I, was, I was just always the guitar player, singer, collaborating, making things up with other people, and then going away, putting my lyricist hat on, and turning it into a song. But it was all collaborative. Um, There's only a couple of songs on the last Ocean Size album where, that I wrote all on me Todd. And so when I went out on my own, it took me years to sort of, just sort of give myself a leg up to be able to go, you can fucking, you can do it, you can do it. Um, but no, I was never a songwriter until that first first album that I did. Wow. Uh, so how, 
how was the, I mean, what was the collab like was it was kind of was it tricky or um it was it was mostly really fun yeah but, um you know most bands are essentially dictatorships mm. all the great bands are you know yeah. cardiacs biffy clyro to name but two mm-hmm. um but this was from day one it was always going to be Ocean Size was always going to be a very collaborative, you know, five-way split um, in everything. The only difference was that it was my job, no matter what, to go away and write the lyrics. I did once or maybe twice allow somebody else in the band to write the lyrics, and it fucking stank the place out so bad. <laughs> I never allowed it to happen never again. Awful. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, blah, 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 blah. It, it was it was mainly very fun. So like you know, a song could come from absolutely anywhere, yeah. and and quite often the the song would come from the drums. Uh, Mark Aaron was a fucking unbelievable drummer. He probably still is, um, and it just he would come in every day. Incredibly vibrant character, very very fucking hyper to a fault. You know. Right. Uh, just fucking ideas, 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 yeah. um, and, and and more often than not, his idea would lead to a, a song. You know, just jamming from the ground up. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so we did a lot of things like that. I think, and t- to this day, to be fair, I don't tend to write very much on guitar because right. I, I feel like being, um, regardless of all the band stuff, I went and I did. GCSE, GCSE music, which was fucking pointless. Learned absolutely nothing. <laughs> and then I did uh, a B Tech popular music and recording. And then I did an A level in music technology just before Pro Tools was invented. So that's fucking pointless as well. <laughs> <laughs> and I did um, three years studying popular music and recording at Salford. So I'm very schooled. I know a lot of shit about theory. And whilst I, I think that I've used it well and I can, you know, I can I can pick things apart and I can hear things and go, oh, that's that mode, that's that harmonic trick, that's that interval, that's that fucking time signature, all that stuff's very handy. But similarly, I've had to unlearn a lot of it. Because if you if you stick to that stuff, then you're gonna end up in dream theatre territory, mm. and nobody wants that. Yeah. So you know, my favourite, but this is quite the dichotomy of my fucking music brand style, whatever you want to call it, is that I really, really love like metal, thrash metal, fucking drone metal. But I also love really, really twee pop, mm. like like the Cardigans, or mm. I really, really love fucking out of tune, slacker grunge like Pavement or something like that. And trying to get, trying to fulfil all these little fantasies of mine is quite a bitter pill, I think, for what I laughably call my fan base to swallow. No, I have got a fan base. I've done great this last week. <laughs> Sorry. I'm trying, trying to be self-deprecating. It's like, no, mate, you've done all right, man. You've done all right. Yeah, yeah it's okay to acknowledge that there are people who buy your records. It's, there are. It's they fine. definitely yeah. are. I can confirm. Um, so, yeah, but I think um, this new record that I've put out is primarily a dark one. There's no sort of sugary-coated sweetness and like well there's a secret track on it that's a that, that is a complete stupid beatles okay. waltz that, doesn't fit. <laughs> that was gonna that was supposed to open the record really and i thought you're not helping matters here because it's a total <laughs> red herring you know? <laughs> oh I've, I've got i've ordered i've ordered the vinyl but I've, so i've just listened to the band camp thing um so i haven't stumbled across that yet <laughs> all right well, yeah, it's it's yes, yeah, it's, it's it's the secret track at the end, not so secret really. All right, um, but it's um, 
I got one of those things. Do you know the Omnicord? Do you know that thing? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I got one of them a few years back. And like I was saying, I can't write songs on guitar because that's what I was talking about. I just, not that I'm fucking Alan Oldsworth or anything, but I know my way around the modes and chord yeah. extensions and all that shit. And so when I come to write a song, quite often muscle memory comes in or... Yeah logical harmony memory comes in. You're like, this is shit. This has just been done. Everybody knows this sound. So mm. Mm. anyway, I, I use the Omnicord to, to just, because the buttons are all in some fucking wacky order. They don't make any logical sense to me anyway. <laughs> if there, if there is a logic to it, I don't want to know what it is. So I just sort of press record and just press the buttons until a really stupid chord sequence comes out. All right. um, and I wrote a concierge, that secret track I was talking about, that's on the Omnicord. Um, I guess I did write a few on guitar this time. But again, to coming back to talking about the drum from Ocean Size, I do now quite often start with the beat, just program a beat and then just play bass along with it. I, I try, try to sort of write on bass and drums quite a lot. Uh, because mm. then when I'm playing the bass, I'm not, necessarily thinking about the chords that are on the top yeah. I'm just thinking about some a nice bass line or a, some nice root notes and then you can put a lot of shit on top of that you know a lot of different colors tonal colors chord yeah. tones it's it's a bit more of a uh blank canvas rather than going here's the guitar chords you and know. everything else has got to do a certain thing underneath that really mm. you know yeah, man. You, uh, it's, you, when you're writing songs, I think you have to force yourself outside of the things that you naturally fall into. Like you say, the, the muscle memory and the, the memory memory, melody mm. memory. Mm. Um, because you do, you've just done it so many times. When you pick up a guitar, you just play stuff which automatically comes out of you. Mm. And that kind of builds patterns in your, in your mind so that you end up doing it even more. And so you have to force yourself outside of that mental space. It's the same with, you know, any creative process, I suppose. You've got to try and get outside of the things which are familiar and comfortable. And yeah. it, it may end up that you come up with something which maybe the chords are the same chords that you would play on the guitar, but because you're approaching them from a different angle, suddenly when you come to put guitar on top of them, your your head is in a completely different space and you can explore different territory. Yeah, totally. Um, I, I think that I'm, I'm really fascinated by dissonance. I love mm. like deer hoof and, and penderecki and all this stuff, but I don't know that because there's good dissonance and bad dissonance. How the, f you know, and, and I've yet to work out, <laughs> you know, because the, the, there can't be any rules there, can there? Really, <laughs> it's, that's the whole point. So, like, fucking, it's fascinating to me. But you know, it's cool. It's nice to have something to learn. Um, and it's just another avenue to investigate, isn't it? Like yeah. you, you get you get into a beaten track, and it's yeah. just boring. I've done this before, and then you can just hop a little bit sideways and and find something that's becomes inspiring again. That's that's quite fun. Yeah, because what I even tend to do, Steve, is when I've when I find a weird tuning, I've got all the pavement tunings here. So Nick, oh really? Oh yeah, I'll send you it. Please. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I, I I try all them, and I can't get it. Fuck it, I can't make any tail of it because my my fingers are just trying to find where are the notes, you know, you know, and and yeah. and when I do find something, I make it sound like a generic shitty chord sequence anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Better off. And also, I can't play the keyboards, can't play piano at all, but that lends itself sometimes mm. to coming up with stuff that's all right, you know. I've, I've yeah. done a few things like that. Um, and it's stupid, because like I say, I know, I know the fretboard really well, but the piano's not like that. It's not... Ah, oh, it's hard to explain. It's all there, but it's it's all different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I keep I've I've tried to sort of sell to sort of teach myself piano many times, but I literally I just can't retain any of it no, <laughs> for some reason. Know. I just 
kind of even like where's middle C? I can't remember. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> it's literally I have to like where's the, the piano? Bread. Exactly. <laughs> Not far off. Really yeah. slow going for me. When I tend to sort of put parts down on me demos and stuff like that, I have to like play them in chord by chord. Yeah. Or sometimes I'll I'll put a part in and just fucking blah, 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 and like anything randomly and then just go through on piano roll and change the notes that are wrong and put them in. And it's fucking great. It's like, well, then that sounds like fucking Mike Garson. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's a thing I used to do when I, when I had time to do any music, I had a, I, it probably up there somewhere, a little Roland synth. What is an MC 202, I think. And it had an inbuilt sequencer which you could either clock to, I don't know, a pulse or MIDI clock or something, or you could just let it run. So what I would do on some of my songs is kind of improvise single note things along to the song and then vary the speed. So like you you just have these kind of weird arpeggios going along with the song and suggesting chords and stuff, but it can completely different speed and it's just quite an interesting right. quite i've discovered it i wouldn't like it was completely by accident that i discovered it i accidentally hit play one day i didn't even know it had been recording but <laughs> that was kind of fun because it makes right. you sound like you know what you're doing and really clearly i didn't <laughs> <laughs> i remember seeing like i was watching this sort of master class with adrian Ballou. You know, mm. uh, King Crimson and, and all that is in Bowie's band. And, like, he does stuff with guitar that I've never heard anybody else do. I was like, fucking hell, this guy is an absolute genius. He played, what is he doing? And then somebody asked him, what, what's, what's that you've got? What, what are you doing with your foot there? And he was like, oh. And he basically has this, it's like a Digitech harmonizer or something like that so he's just playing all his stuff you know he's, he's got some weird techniques and all that but he'll just keep tapping this fucking harmonizer on and off so that it'll jump up like a major third or something like that all right and just um, so in the middle of a run and it's like it just throws it completely into another key for a couple of seconds and then goes back down and you're like that's all it is. Why are you fucking speaking in some completely alien fucking language? And you're just tapping a wee button. Yeah. So it's real like the fucking, the wee guy behind the fucking. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, yeah isn't magic. it? It's, that's it, isn't it? It's funny. We want it to be magic. We don't yeah. want it to be a, a kind of pedestrian trick want it actually to be some kind of genuine Ooh. genius yeah and i yeah. think you know like um alan oldsworth i think that was just fucking card carrying mental genius like i can't listen to it for, for very long but i won't see him loads of times the last time i saw him it took me about an hour to realize he was playing in standard tuning just watching, what the fuck is, he's a fucking alien, this guy, what's he doing? Yeah. And then at one point I just went, all right, okay, that was, that was like a, just a regular triad he played there. <laughs> <laughs> I went to see him, I went to see him at Ronnie Scott's this really? eight ago, and um, I had to leave early because the sound he was using was just making me feel really weird. Everything was just, <laughs> I was felt almost sick. <laughs> uh... It was just this like chorusy thing going on and just, insane amounts of stuff yeah but when i was a kid i saw him using the um the synfax remember that oh, thing mm. fucking hell i mean I, I just looked like a weird fucking hoover or something man <laughs> <laughs> oh man so um how was how did ocean size going back to that thing go, um, go from you guys getting stuff together in in a, in a room to to the road and to albums and stuff. What was the kind of journey there? I don't know. I mean, like we were going for five, for four years before we got signed and we were not that we were ready to pack it up or anything, but we were like, um, yeah, I don't know. I, we, we just got offered a deal out of nowhere. We played this gig in Leeds to fucking nobody except my mom and, and my brother and that. And 
but it was a good gig. We played well. And we got an email the next day from this guy at Beggar's Banquet saying, I saw you in Leeds. I travelled up from London to see you in Leeds last night. And I thought it was absolutely fantastic. Let's talk. Got offered a deal. And at this point, I was still like, I thought we were good. But I didn't know what kind of band we were. I didn't get it. I didn't know. I enjoyed playing it. And I enjoyed listening to it. I got an awful lot of pleasure out of, you know. Because that's what your band is, isn't it? You're making things for you to listen to, you know, yeah. I had my own record on this morning that, you know, so you, you, you have the sort of great creative impulse of being in the thick of making it trade, you know, chasing this trail of little clues as to what you should do next, this whole fractal process of, you know, one idea turning into a million ideas and all these different paths you could take all the time. That's really exciting. And so you make the record and put it out. And then I'll have maybe two weeks of listening to it and I'll never, ever listen to it again. Mm. That'll be it. But that's fun. That's that's great. I love it. I, I really enjoy that. With Ocean Size, it was like I, I got all those things out of it as if I was constantly listening to it, trying to work out what the fuck I was doing. What, like, what? Are we, are we a fucking prog rock heavy metal band like Tool? Yeah. Are we a post rock band like Mogwai? Are we... I just didn't know what we were, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think by the second album, I kind of embraced all that even more. It's like, well, I'm going to turn, I'm going to try and make some of these into songs rather than just singing over your fucking long instrumental things. I'm going to actually shape it into songs more. Uh, and then we didn't get any radio play whatsoever. We thought that second album it was going to be like the bends or something, you know, yes. gonna, suddenly everyone's going to go, Oh, these are great, man. And n- nobody gave a fuck. So we went for the third album, just decided, right. Well, fuck everyone. You know, we won't do any singles. We certainly won't be doing any radio edits. So all the songs are like eight minutes long on that third album. Yeah. Uh, and sure enough, Somebody at the record company, when we gave it to them, they were like, well, we need a single. I said, well, there ain't one. We, like, well, well, we need you to do a radio edit of this song. The song was eight minutes long, and they wanted it trimming down to three and a half. I was like, Fucking, you, you go and do your radio edit. Don't ask me to check it. Don't ask me to ever fucking hear it, okay? Of course, it didn't get some. So somebody got paid to make a radio edit, and it never got used. So, but um, I don't know what I don't really know how to answer the question. We just sort of decided. In, in in it was basically if we can play it. I think in the early days of Ocean Size, there's things that ended up on the first album that had been sat around for years because we yeah. didn't play them live. We had like the the, the song that's on the end of. The first album is called Long Forgotten. That had been sat on the shelf for at least two years. Because uh, we were... At, <laughs> exactly. That's why it's called that. So we were not... We weren't confident enough to be going out and playing a 10-minute song that didn't rock. That right. Didn't, that, that was a long... It's kind of... You know, we wanted to be like talk, talk or something. We wanted to be... We wanted people to really focus on the details and... And we wanted things to be frail as well as really brash and fucking harsh. Uh, but we didn't really have the confidence to to go out and 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 because people are too busy, you know. Um, they just if you don't you don't want to just be playing something quiet to people while they're all talking over a pint. And it's like yeah. that's when I get angry and that's when I make a dick of myself on stage. Start telling people to shut the fuck up and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's it's really difficult, and it and it, it's a. I've not seen very many people be able to come into a room where not basically none of the audience know them, and then just captivate the audience. So the there was a there's a guy, I I'm not sure what his name is. I think he's Swedish. Um, his band at the time that I saw him was called Lonely Deer, and he was supporting some friends of mine at uh, Shepherd's Bush Empire. And he had kind of an odd, an odd band. I think they had like fiddle player and keys, drummer, guitar and something. Anyway, he 
somehow in the space of a support set of, I guess it's going to be 25 minutes, he was playing one of his songs just like super, super quietly. It went from everything down to virtually nothing, just him on the acoustic guitar. And then he had everyone kind of clapping along without even anyone in the band kind of saying, mm. you need to clap along. Mm. I That's almost impossible. The only way that I can kind of make a path towards maybe being able to take someone a along for a ride of a 10 minute song is for them to inhabit the world. Mm. So you've got to have the record out and mm. they know the record and they know the track and they kind of, it's like a, a, a well-worn path and they can just yeah. enjoy that as a journey that's familiar, mm. but taking someone on a journey like that, just the people, like you say, they're too busy and they don't have the attention span. No, and it's it's just really hard. And as a new band, it's it's daunting, at least. Yeah, it was it was always a concern, but that you know we we were really we were into like Nine Inch Nails, and we were into Angel Knows by the Trail of Dead, and it was like we just wanted to fucking kill everyone. It was like no matter what, we're gonna fucking flatten this place. Mm. That was the early days mentality. It's like just you know we we were unsigned, and we were like. We don't fucking care. It's like, we're, we're, we're going to make everybody walk out of this place and be able to say, well, I don't like that kind of stuff, but they were fucking good. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and that, that was always the point to be undeniably good. Um, I don't know. It's not me. I've turned my email off. <laughs> <laughs> I keep trying to turn my, I've turned it off, but of course there's be some notification thing. I haven't, I don't know where it is to flick off somewhere. <laughs> so, I do apologize. Like all right. Um, Performance is a is a funny thing, isn't it? Because it it is a it's a completely different medium than recorded music. Mm. And it isn't yeah, I don't I don't really know what I'm trying to say here, but that and it's been said a billion times before, but it's it's almost unfathomable to me how a record can be one thing and then go and see someone live and it's a completely different thing even though they're playing the same thing but it's it's definitely like if you have the choice between hearing a record once or going and seeing a gig of people playing ostensibly the same thing i mean it's hands down you go and see the gig because it's, yeah you get so much more from it from the do, communication and, between and the band and the people so many times i've there's a record out by a band that i like and i, I, I don't really it's not, it's not really clicked to me. I'll go and see him play it live and go, oh my God, right now. It's yeah. a fucking, it is, it's a favourite. I think, you know, I can't speak for Simon uh, from Biffy, but he seems to have this incredible knack of knowing uh, how something is going to go down live. So I, I, as we've been saying, I, I work on my Todd now and just fling shit at a computer and uh, just jam with myself to get something going. He, I don't think he necessarily trusts whether a song is any good until he gets together with the other two lads and they play at fucking battle volume and then they go, mm. right. Now, you know, he, he, I don't think he really, really knows until he's done that. That it's like, that's a fucking good song. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't know what my point was, but yeah, I think that like, what were we talking about? Well, it's just, again... My ideas about what is an interesting performance are, are really not to be trusted. Because, Why? Because I, I quite like subversive ideas and I like bands that deliberately piss their audience off by... Like the, the, there's a case in point here. We Ocean Side is like this is like 2008 or something like that. Played Sonosphere Festival at, at Nebworth. Couldn't believe it. We got offered a fucking festival. That never happened. And we were really excited. There's loads of good bands on, and one of the bands was Nine Inch Nails. They were so bad lining. They were playing in the in the broad daylight, glorious sunshine, and it's a fucking metal fest. They came on with a quiet, slow building, piano-led instrumental that got quite loud. And then 
they went the rest of the set like an hour set was just quiet somber piano whispered vocals at a fucking heavy metal festival and you could there's just all these metal kids just tearing their hair out like ah just fuck oh, come on and I was I was admittedly on ecstasy but it I was like it's just fucking unbelievable you could cut the atmosphere with a fucking knife you know just like how dare they but I loved it I absolutely mm. loved it and and um you know there's been times where for example we were supporting Faith No More once Mm. Uh, and I'm like the biggest Faith No More fan. I just fucking worship Faith No More. <laughs> and uh, we had we just put out an Ocean Size had just put out an EP called Home and Minor, which is like a it was our version of a fucking unplugged EP. But there's no acoustics on it. It's all just you know more settled. Anyway, the the opening song on that EP is like this sort of little lullaby bossa nova. Mm that doesn't rock in the slightest it's like quite spacey and cute yeah i thought let's open with that at this faith no more support thinking that faith no more fans are used to sort of antagonistic you know sassy fucking weird rock bands and it didn't work it didn't <laughs> work at all literally people just standing at the front like that mm. uh, so yeah. Big regret. But know, then, but then you work, achieved your you? aim. You achieved your aim, didn't you? Yeah, I you know. Wanted to hack off the audience. I don't know. I, I, I was just disappointed they didn't get it. I thought they'd like it. <laughs> yeah, they, they would. They, they were actually genuinely disappointed. Ugh, you know, I I went speaking. You've got to try these things. Well, this is it. I once I once went to see Mr. Bungle, Mike Patton's fucking band, um, and they it was on their second album. And not only did they not play anything at all from their first album, they barely played any of their own songs at all. It was just <laughs> much covers the whole night and it'd be, you know, a lot of Ennio Morricone or a lot of just free jazz, fucking jazz odyssey explorations. And you could just see this fucking wilting crowd of sweaty metalers at Jilly's Rock World like, you bastards, just play <laughs> one fucking riff, you know. <laughs> absolutely amazing <laughs> but that surely that's what you want from a side project isn't it you don't want to go and hear them play the normal band's songs just with yeah. different people i mean it, that, that's basically a covers band isn't it well yeah, yeah. i mean i mean th th that said but there's no defense for Corey taylor's solo project <laughs> Have you heard Corey Taylor's no. solo project? No. I mean, why would you? Why <laughs> would you <heard> it? That bad. <laughs> You've never. I mean, I'm having a midlife crisis, right? There's no doubt about it, and it's it's quite spectacular. This is a fucking midlife crisis, crisis cubed. This guy, you gotta check it out, man. Oh it's, man, it's I'm a song it's called CMFT or something like that. Uh, so, I mean, I, I, I could watch it a hundred times. I probably have. Um, you've never seen anything like it. CMFT. Right. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's my afternoon done. <laughs> oh, man. But um, what was, how did you find, how did you find touring and getting used to that, that kind of life and, um, um, on road, off road. Well, you know, I did more. Obviously, most of it in Ocean Size was in a van. I think a couple of occasions we had a bus. Um, and I think when you're in your twenties, early thirties, you can do that. You can go around Europe for five weeks in a van and not break up. We drove from one end of America to the other wow. across across the space of about two and a half, three weeks. Supporting McCluskey in 2004. Jeez. And like I so, said, I mean, that nearly fucking killed me because it's like, there's no, there's no sleep. You're just in a car. It wasn't even a van. It was just a fucking car. Mm. And it didn't have, it didn't even have headrests. So you couldn't, <sighs> couldn't <laughs> nod out. So that, those are things that you can only do at that point in your life. And it was hard enough then. 
I, I wouldn't do it now. You know, I could do it now. I, I get offered things like that, but I just don't have, I can't be asked. I, you know, yeah. I'd rather not. Um, I'm very lucky that when I talk with Biffy, we're in a bus and cause I like, I like to sleep a lot. Um, <laughs> I actually have a, a sort of mild sort of sleep apnea. So I can just fucking drop asleep in a, in a hot second, man. Really? So yeah, like after sound check, religiously, I will just go somewhere and shut my eyes for half an hour. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, so yeah, we said, we're, I'm, I'm, I love touring. I absolutely love it. It's a very, it's a certain mindset and, and, this is really uh, underlined whenever anybody comes on tour with us, you know, girls will come out and wives will come out and hang out on tour with us and stuff like that. And they'll just be like, right. Is this it then? You're, you got to <laughs> you've sat, you've got out of bed and now you're just going to sit in this dressing room for 10 hours until you play. And you're like, yeah, you know, so, <laughs> Because you've always got at the back of your mind conserving energy, conserving. Mm. You're just tired anyway. No matter what, no matter what circumstances or, or um, privileges you're afforded, such as a, a tour bus or a hotel room, you are tired. Because gigging or playing guitar for a band like Biffy is actually really physical. Yeah, yeah. And I tend to drink the best part of a bottle of wine after a gig and that doesn't help. Yes. It, it, so it doesn't matter how much you sleep. Yeah. But also, and this is an important to, to be, to, 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 to be not flippant for a moment, just for a moment, mind the amount of fucking adrenaline that is coursing through your veins when you're playing for a band like Biffy, particularly if you're playing Reading Festival, Glastonbury, or, or like that, that can take you about a week to get over. Like mm. if it weren't for the fact that you might have a, another gig the next day and you just got to fucking shit yourself out of it. There's been times where I've come back off tour with Biffy and it's only been one or two gigs. The, the, the first time I discovered this was when we, they put out ellipsis and we did a week of live broadcast TV and radio, which is just fucking absurd high level adrenaline fear excitement all these things are coursing through you and there is tremendously exciting you know but you've got to get it right and mm. no matter how much you practice it and no matter how, how fucking easy it is there's a part of your brain going don't fall off <laughs> yeah <laughs> don't look down don't yeah. look down <laughs> Cause that's how you fuck up. But, um, and yeah, and then you'll come home and you feel like you've just, you know, fucking been in a fight or something. It's just absolutely knackering. It's really yeah. weird. Yeah. It's, I think it's probably as much mental as it is physical, isn't it? Cause it's obviously, it's not natural for your body to have those kind of spikes of adrenaline. And especially when it's a tour rather than just a one-off, one-off is bad enough, but when it's a tour, your body is having, and probably other things like cortisol and stuff flying around your body as well. It's not great for you. And there, and there is an aftermath. It's supposed to be like, I need to get out of here super quick mm. or I need to perform right now. And then, you know, it will be months and months before, before that you're in that state again. But with tour yeah. or any kind of performance like that, how do you go to sleep afterwards? You've got to sleep, but how on earth do you do it? No, you can't. I was I was uh, watching this interview with uh, Bruce Dickinson at Vine Maiden, and he's on about when he's on stage, he's like projecting so much, like trying to blow a huge balloon so it reaches the very very back row and they can touch the balloon and they, he's, he's filling this fucking huge space. Mm -hmm. And then he says after the gig, he's driven back to his hotel. He'll get in. He'll get the bin out of the hotel room, turn it upside down, put it in the shower, get a beer out of the fridge, and sit in the in the shower on the bin drinking his beer. And he'll sit there for like an hour or two hours until the balloon is deflated. And like, <laughs> it's just fucking remarkable. And like Biffy, like smoke just tons and tons of weed. That's no great secret. I'm sure they won't mind me saying. 
Um, and I think that personally, I, I'm not sort of designed for um, my my role in in Biffy is absolutely perfectly designed for me because I get to have all the fun of the fair, bouncing around, playing my guitar to some fucking great songs. I get to hang out with the best fucking lads, have a really good laugh. And they're lovely, lovely folk. They're just genuinely sweet. And then I get to go to bed and not worry about it. Mm. Whereas they have this incredible pressure to, you know, like, well, what next? You know, as soon as you do anything, you've got to start thinking, well, what next? Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not cut out for that. Um, and I'm not, I, I wouldn't be cut out for the kind of criticism they take either. Uh, because it don't matter how good you are at that level for as much love as you're going to get, you're going to get people throwing pelters at you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Come on, come and and that would really, really hurt me. And I'm sure it hurts them as well. Um, but I couldn't handle it. Yeah. Couldn't handle that at all. Did you get any of that in ocean size? Only wee bits, you know, like you, you, you have a shit gig and then with the advent of my space, you get wee kids just, Texting you mm. saying that you, you're a dickhead because it was a shit gig. And it was my birthday. You didn't play my favourite song. You know, yeah. stuff like that. But you know, it's a small fry. But it still hurts. You know, it's mm. like for every good review you get, you know, I I I took a paste in a few years back with the fucking far right. I rattled the hive. Oh, of yeah, I remember that. Fucking <laughs> that Tommy Robinson guy and all that. Just like, you know, and and. That got serious. I I thought it was really funny, um, and I I was quite happy about it. And then, but then, come Christmas Eve, when I had to fireproof the fucking house, and I'm still getting death threats on Christmas Day, you know, that it stopped being funny because mm-hmm. I, you know, I had a wife and kid. You know, it's like fucking scumbags. But yeah, so that kind of thing is like I'm not. I I don't really care about criticism and all that it's like i don't it's easy for me to say that i'll get the ump and i'll argue with people but i don't it's like it's not for you is it's not designed for you but if there was hundreds of thousands of people all over the world sort of being dicks to me then i'd probably be a bit bummed out yeah i mean it's always you know you can you can meet because you know have a gazillion people tell you that things are good you're doing you know whatever you've done is good and then you just get one person oh yeah and it's 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 that that sticks out, and it's. Mm. I mean, we, I I, I get it here. I mean, you know, even like on social and yeah. stuff, you do start, you know, anything with, a, I don't know, any old video on how to do something, and you get some somebody going, that's wrong. Your camera angle's wrong. Um, I don't think you uh, you didn't add anything to my life. So, well, <laughs> cool. Um, please, how can I make it up to you? <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for thanks for writing that. I had some guy like I don't get much guitar problems really, but some guy. Um, I've got a buzz stop on my Jazzmaster. You yeah. know what that is a little, yeah, it's a little behind. roller behind it. Yeah, yeah. And this guy was like, "You really should take that off. You'll get a lot more out of the guitar." And I was like, "Well, a lot more buzz." I, I, yeah, I mean, I'm all right. I know, I, I know what it does. I know what happens without it. I get all that, you know, chimey harmonics coming off it, and it's like, well, maybe if you fucking listen to someone, maybe you'll, maybe, maybe Biffy will let you play on one of their records. And I was like, what? <laughs> I've used this guitar on a Biffy record. If that's all right. <laughs> it's, it's because of Biffy that's on there, and you're like. Why am I getting so angry about some complete mm. random schmuck who just, oh, uh, another one as well. I, I mean, I, it's it's funny. It's this this is one of my favourites. The other day, and um, there's an Oceanside song called "Music for a Nurse." That was the one um, that got was on the Orange advert. It was on the or- Orange advert, it was on a couple of movies and all this stuff. It's the one. It's mm. it's that famous now, that song, that I saw one of the first ever demos of a Kemper and, and somebody started playing that song. No. Now we're into the realm of guitar demo. That's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You've arrived. You made it, man. 
Um, and anyway, it was on that song, and it was the the lyrics are about a, a, a bereavement. This a long time ago, you know. And somebody, one of my favorite comments ever was, uh, "This is the whitest fucking song ever written." This girl, it's a show, mate. We've all had a girlfriend. Cheer the fuck up! <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> imagine like forcing the energy out of your hands. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have to do it! I have to do it! You know, so fucking great. I love the internet. I absolutely love it. Yeah, it. Why do people feel like they have to? Ha, they have to articulate that feeling that they have. Oh. They, I remember that there was um. It, let me indulge myself for a second. There, it, we had just sold a couple of amps to uh, Jared from Kings of Leon, and. Mm. I can't even remember how maybe someone else told me about it or something. There was a base forum and there was this thread about Jared from Kings of Leon. Oh, he's got these new amps. And basically the people on there were conjecturing that he had been given these amps um, and that they weren't even turned on anyway and that they, they were rubbish and he should go back to his Ampex. Um, I was like, I know, I know. It's fascinating. It's really, really fascinating. Going that Tommy Robinson episode, the minute that that happened, within like an hour, there was a, a sort of viral tweet going around that I was best mates with Ian Watkins out of the Lost Prophets, renowned <laughs> yeah. sex offender. And I was like, I've not even fucking met this guy. It's like, what? What's the worst thing we could say about him? About mm. this? About Mike Venner? It's like, that's pretty bad, man. That's pretty bad. Oh man. Yeah. People just want to be news. Yeah, yeah. It's so. Is that that's all kind of died to death now? Is yeah. That... Well, I mean, this is it. Deplatforming works, man. You know. Remember Katie Hopkins? Not not for very much longer, you won't, you know? Uh, Tommy Robinson's fucked. He's absolutely broke. Drifting <laughs> 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 prick. Um, what else? Who else is there? I don't know. They're all... This is it. They're all... They're, they're all on their ass. Farage will be on his ass. you know? It's all... All that stuff being removed from platforms, it works, so... Yeah. Yeah, that's another story though. But yeah, I'm all right. Don't get any bother. People keep sort of pro- cop- uh, popping up from time to time on social media. It's YouTube is where they all dwell. Really? They all, they all like to come on. Like, so I've done that. I've done videos for like Orange and Fender and stuff like that, and they just. What, what? When it happened, I actually started getting emails to my agent, and they were telling my agent that I was an actual holocaust denying nazi and that i must be dropped immediately from the roster and so i had my agent email me going what have you done now i was like oh, not done that but uh, <laughs> so it's all right but like fuck you know it's crazy isn't it it's like yeah um i was i was watching this interview the other day with um Irvin Welsh, and he's on about like this cancellation culture being, it's like when we're offended now, we demand compensation. Mm. It's like the the fact that I had upset a renowned white supremacist really irked other people of a similar persuasion and they demand, they couldn't have my head on a spike. So they were like, what else can we do? So that, you know, it was like they, they went to company's house online to find what they thought was my address so they could come and fucking do God knows what. Um, blah, blah, blah. Oh, a minute. Very, very serious. <laughs> I just had a, this is, this is quite a good subject change for you. This will cheer you up. I just had a text from Simon Neal of Biffy Clyro fame. Me and him are very close to finishing writing. I'd say 99% finish writing a, what is it? It's 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 Christmas the best song. metal album, best metal album in the world ever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wicked! Yeah. 
So we're, we're, that's that you know how like you get those compilations of metal of of, of bands things it's like that it's just basically all all kinds of metal and it's a, a band called Empire State Bastard. <laughs> 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 and it's, it's been in the pipeline for at least a decade oh, uh, but i started actually writing things for it well i started writing things for it a long time ago but nothing really stuck i guess yeah. i was out of the i wasn't listening to as much metal and now i'm back because i'm having a proper midlife crisis now as i said right, yeah. <laughs> loads of metal um so yeah it's happening uh, a lot of c standard fucking this guy what do you say oh, yes. nice yeah we're yeah, no. talking man um yeah C standard and Simon is just screaming his fucking head off uh lots of you know blast beats double kicks just pure metal man tantric metal wicked <laughs> so when, when's that when do you reckon that will be I think we're going to record Record early next year. Oh, wish it. Um, but I'm so happy because, um, like I say, I had these songs. I, me and I, I gave them to Simon like last January, mm. and he was just busy, obviously doing celebration of endings. Took ages to record, and then they've just been sat waiting. They got put back. It's never been quite a good time. So lockdown. If there's one thing I know about Simon is that he's like a fucking cat on a hot tin roof when he can't do what he wants to do, which is go out on tour and play his new record. And I was like, well, the only thing that really makes you happy is making records. So let's Make do it. Records. And uh, he's really got his teeth into it. And he's just screaming his fucking... He's got the best scream, you know, like nobody sounds as fucking pained... <laughs> oh, it's horrible! It's yeah, oh, <laughs> really good. I'm really excited about that. Um, yeah, that'll be we're recording soon. As Denzel's going to be playing drums on it. He plays drums for me, and uh, we're just working out the ins and outs. But um, yeah, it's real. I'm really excited. It's. It, I mean, like. It, I, I, I like to think that it sounds like both of us. It doesn't just sound like. Oh, and now I'm gonna wear my heavy metal hat. Right. It's still pretty mathy. Yeah. Pretty doomy, but I think that it, you know, there's a there's a there's a ley line between everything that we've done together. Uh, but that's always been our relationship is to play since day one. We've known each other nearly twenty years now. And right. since day one, it's just been trying to freak each other out with the most fucking mental music you could find. <laughs> you know, that's been a, a large part of our relationship. So. Like, we've got like, to make our own record like this. <laughs> oh, man. That's uh, this just got that's got good shit written all over it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! So one thing that we we've sort of started asking people when we do these things is like, have you? Is there anything that you're listening to at the minute? Any like new? bands new you know any or, or what are you listening to at the minute so if you said you're getting back into the metal <laughs> yeah yeah um there's because i'm sort of i guess it's been about 10 years since i've like okay let me let me try and work this out about eight years ago with biffy we went and played the soundwave festival in australia mm. which is a metal festival and I had this really awful epiphany that I I was like, metal is done. It's fucking over. Because it was all, you know, fucking seven shades of bring me the horizon, backing track, double kick, mess a boogie, fucking twin vocalists. It was fucking horrible. They were all identical. And then I just sort of looked a bit beyond it and I sort of discovered the sort of Southern Lord label. Obviously I love Dipicac and all that. And it's like, you know, there is, there is a total different like Roadburn festival and whatnot where you just get just more, what's the word? I don't know. Just sort of more artistry rather mm. than sort of anguish, teenage emo bullshit of like, you know, <laughs> you know, 
more dragons and castles, less parental anguish, I think. Yeah. Where it's at. Running to the hills. <laughs> All that shit. Um, so, yeah. And, and But, yeah, so I'm listening to... I'm just really, really into, like, sun and sleep. Um, Boris, I really like Boris. Mm-hmm. Um, the new Mr. Bungle album is fucking crazy thrash metal record. Quite yeah. annoyingly, they've kind of beat us to it a little bit. Um, <laughs> also, but my, my favourite new band is a band called Sugar Horse uh, right. from Bristol. They are, well, it, they, it's quite narcissistic of me to say because they're a very... They, they 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 say they're really influenced by Ocean Size, but I don't really hear that. I just when when bands say they're influenced by Ocean Size, chances are I'm not going to be really into it. But mm-hmm. this is fucking something else. It's just really doomy, really heavy. Really, it's like screaming, but also with these fucking really lush like um, uh, shoe shoegazy sort of Depeche Mode esque vocals. They're like. It's like there's been a band fucking custom designed like algorithmically to what exactly I want to fucking hear. I think they're fucking brilliant. Really love them. Well, that's that's a that's a rather good endorsement. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't want to be wishy washy, but that's what I tend to be like. I, you know, I tend to be like, no, nah, it's all right. I, I, I'm not. I'm never like, oh, it's all right. It's either yeah. fucking brilliant or pff, yeah, shit. Like, no, no, I got. So, I, how did you how did you get into pavement because that's a long way from any of the music that we've been talking about as your influences that's that's a funny story man um my stepdad who is coincidentally my guitar teacher that's another story uh-huh. yeah Yay. <laughs> so um he was he taken his students out one night, you know, as as they do. I'm gonna hire a minibus, I'll take you all out to a gig. What gig do you want to go to? And he came to me the next day going, I saw this is 1992. I saw the worst band in the fucking world last night. Do not ever, ever go and see pavement. And I, was like, <laughs> I was like noted. And and as it turned out, you know, you see footage of pavement, pavement in two, in 1992, and you can you can well imagine a guitar teacher being like, "The fuck is this shit?" And the drummer <laughs> doing fucking headstands and handing out cabbage. Um, <laughs> anyway, sure enough, in 1997, this exact same thing happened with Radiohead as well. Basically, uh, the bass player in Ocean Size put on "Brighten the Corners," and halfway through the first song, I went, "What is this?" And it was pavement. I just like fuck, and that just changed everything. Because also at that time, you had Radiohead, and and Johnny Greenwood being this sort of anti-guitar hero, mm. playing just making a lot of fucking horrible noise with the guitar, making it uh, all sort of discordant and horrible, really weird solos, and so it was Johnny Greenwood that re- really sort of piqued my interest, and then from him, I could totally. I was totally on the level with pavement. I was like, now I get this weird approach to guitar. I really, it really fucking just lit up another circuit in my brain. I'm like, all right. Okay. Uh, and I've never gotten over pavement. I've never gotten over them to the point where that orange on the bottom is the one that I saw them using. I went to see them on their reunion tour, like three times. I actually played with them once. Oh wow! No way! Yeah, I didn't know. I, I didn't get on stage with them. We were just playing at the same festival. Oh right, right, right! right. <laughs> I did get on stage with Iron Maiden once. That's another story. That's very Aww. cool. Um, but that amp, the, the, like every time I went to see them, I was like, "What the fuck is that sound? That like, the best guitar sound I'd ever heard. Like clean, but so fucking full, and the pedals were ripping." And uh, I managed to get a good picture. I was like, it's the retro 50. And I just joined Biffy at that point. So I was on orange going, right, fucking endorsement deal. Let's go, man. I'm a big deal now. <laughs> and they were like, cool. What is it you want? And I went, I want the retro 50. And they said, you can have any of our amps for free, except that one. And I was wow. like, yeah, fucking take the money. It's custom shop. So it was like, right, right. no freebies, man. But uh, it's still... I bought I bought the the overdrive as well. It's like a 1978 thing. 
And I still think I prefer that one. That's fucking so good. When it's right, it's oh. right. Right. Mm-hmm. Honestly, I get I really get so fetishistic about that. I'm five knobs and the truth. Because I don't know how to work. You know, I used to have like uh I've had like Mesa Boogie mark this, mark that. Fucking too many switches and mm. no. I've told you about having the Strymon timeline. I got one because you recommended yeah. it. Yeah. And yeah. I had it in the drawer for about five years before I could even bring myself to I could get a sound out of it, but I couldn't save it and recall it. And I was like, ah, because yeah. I just don't have that brain. It's like, you know, I'll just use the DM2 again, you yeah. know. But that's do you know what I actually I I I got one and oh, there was that ice setting you know the one with the all the yeah i think what we were talking about and then um i used i started to gig with it and i i i just stamp on all the all the knobs because they're all like there's so many of the bloody things and then it would be yeah. doing things that i didn't know how to get it back do yeah. whatever Come back. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just like it's just yeah then it was just like line six dl4 back there you go thank you nice that's a good, <laughs> yeah that's a really interesting point because oh, you don't want anything like that going wrong Oh, no. I had another one when I, for my sins, I used, I had a line six spider valve when the, it was a covers band thing I was in and I needed to nice. cover everything. Mm. And I thought I'd stopped using a hundred watt like Marshall from like when I was doing original bands and I was using that, that didn't really work. So I got this thing because it was relatively cheap. But every time you touched any of the knobs, it would trigger whatever that effect was. But it also happened if you were playing at volume, the whole thing would shake, moving all the knobs around. And, um, <laughs> so, so I, with this, we we played at the Albert Hall, right? For fun, it was Fund Manager of the Year. I've never seen a group of more angry, coked-up men in my life. <laughs> so there's us, and we were like, we were we were all we all dressed in white. It's quite camp, and we're jumping around. And then we start off with like a Madonna song or anything, something. But the night after that. Deep Purple were playing at the Albert Hall and they had their rig, their rig was already there. So we're going through their PA. Wow. There was three massive subs under the stage. So the first, <laughs> first thing, first song comes on, there's balloons coming down. There's these like glitter cannons and all this crap. And um, all the effects came on. Literally, it was just like, it's, it's <laughs> like, gong, 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 gong. It was going like, wicked, the blah, 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 so um, I literally, because you know, just had I I was the tech for the band as well. So like, it's like could go back, get some gaffer tape, and just gaffer the whole front of the M. <laughs> oh my god, man! <laughs> Promptly sold it. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I remember because um, I worked in a guitar shop like for a day once. They just needed an extra guy, and I tried out that thing, uh, one of those amps, and it had the all these different distortions on it. And one of them was just called insane. Yes. And it was just fucking great fun. You were like standing in front of it going, yes. And you know that if you put it through a PA, it'd just be like, yeah. <laughs> horrible. Yeah, yeah man. But That's the, the one day I worked at a guitar shop and walked out of the place with a mess of boogie combo. I was like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, when I started, uh, the, when I, well, my apprenticeship and everything in at Chandler's in Kew, literally I spent, I mean, I was, I was getting paid fucking nothing at, at all. It was like under a hundred quid a week. <laughs> and, um, but I'd still spend all my money on whatever yeah. I could get. Stuff. Yeah. Just stuff. Every, that was the times when I had a, that Mesa combo never worked. And I swore <laughs> from that point on, I would never, ever use them again. They're a nightmare to repair as well. An yeah, because they're like nightmare. dedicated, like this different stuff, isn't it? And it and they they have loads of vatrals and stuff to do the switching inside, like just tons of them, and they're all on massive PCBs, so you have to take everything apart to do mm. anything on anything. Mm. But yeah, then I, you know they are what they are. But uh, if someone tells me they've got a mess of boogie with a problem, I say, well, go and find someone else to fix it for you because uh, yeah. I'm not getting into that. No, no, that's exactly what it was. This was 20 years ago, 22 years ago. And it was just like you've got to send it up to to Glasgow every time to get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I mean, we had one, and he doesn't always fix it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, there was the what was the one that Dave Grohl was using? We had all like relay switching and all kind of crazy stuff. The that was oh yeah, it was the 90s one that they only did for a couple of years. Um uh, I can't remember what it's called now. Anyway, I mean this guy, I remember it was really expensive and um in in the shop and this guy had what well, you know Master. That yeah, I think yeah, I think so. But um, the guy this guy had bought it, we had to order it in specially, it was like six grand or whatever it was. Um he got it home, plugged it in, and all the filter caps exploded. Or something like that. Something exploded inside it and coated all the boards. So all of the boards needed to be replaced, and they wouldn't. It wouldn't send it. <laughs> they, they had. It wasn't like a warranty thing, apparently, because it was something. Lord knows what. So, oh. Lord. But no, I, I. It's one of them. The the only thing I've had in in that realm where I will never make this mistake again is I bought a Les Paul six years ago and I've probably, it's just, I just bought a Les Paul studio P90 is on it mm. and I love, looks great. It sounds great. It will not stay in tune. And I, uh, I've had three nuts on it. I've put all like locking machine heads. I've got fucking one of these wee string butler things on it. Yeah. And I will never buy another Les Paul. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> Yeah. Ah, and it's such a common thing, man. With, with, is it? Yeah, really, really common. But weirdly, and I remember when I was at I was at, went to the Guitar Institute in Acton back in two thousand, and one of the teachers there was a guy called Barry Langton, an amazing like chord melody player. But he had a, mm. um, a Les Paul Custom that he bought in the seventies, and he said that it was so unstable until the mid nineties, and then it's been rock solid since. And that was his. That was his guitar, like everyday guitar from then on. Yeah. What is that all about? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It's got maybe it's something to do with the woods not being dried out properly or something like that. I don't. I don't know. But when they're it, I've got, sorry. No, it's just when when they're when they're in and they're stable, you can't really beat them. Yeah. It's getting. I've got, I've got an SG, like in terms of like three aside guitars, we've got an SG and a three three five. And they're absolutely bonzer, no problems whatsoever. Got that Les Paul, and then through a swap, I got another one, Les Paul Traditional. And that's the fucking same. Mm. Just won't stay in tune. But yeah, it's one of those things where you're like trying to go logically going, how? <laughs> so like, I didn't think of the wood thing that, you know, maybe oh, they've got a bad rep, aren't they, these days? Yeah, they have, there's patches where they go, they're either really good or they they can be unfortunately can be a bit shonky i mean mm. we have one again it's a guy ordered a custom uh black beauty or something when I, this mm. is back in must have been 2012 13 mm. it arrived i tighten the truss rod to set it up and the fingerboard pops off like literally the from about the nut to the seventh fret just go like that so send it back get another one the same thing happens again so i mean i can't remember if we did we sent it back again but whichever way in the end i i just glued it back down and sent it off but it's just oh my god yeah. what's that all about man i don't know but when they're good they're so good <laughs> yeah this this explorer is great fun mm. i've set that to see standard and that is just fucking really silky and uh, yeah, yeah, really yeah. Digging, you know and you look great as well Oh yeah, it's fantastic. One of the best looking guitars. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. I love those. Oh, and you can't believe it's from the fifties. It doesn't look like a fifties design at all. Mind you, it looks like the side of the car, though. You know, like the fin on a fifties car. It's kind of got that kind of vibe. Yeah, yeah. Close eye. Which is <laughs> which is wicked. Yeah, man. Oh man. We God. should we should have gone on to how you actually learn to play the guitar because we did we kind of skipped over. Okay. All of that stuff. Can we do that quickly before yeah, sure. everyone's um, got to go? <laughs> I was. Um, I have got a lesson at three o'clock. Yeah, I got to get my daughter at three o'clock as well. Right. So um, we got to crack on. <laughs> okay. Well, I um, I'd spent probably a year, a little bit more, just teaching myself out of a book. You know, what book and, was it? 
Oh, it was something from the library. Fucking just teach yourself to play guitar. We pocketbook. Mm, okay. Um, and so, you know, I, I was mad on Black Sabbath at that point. Um, so I taught myself all, you know, those. The first riff I ever learned to play was NIB by Black Sabbath before I'd even heard it. And somebody told me that. Um, I was just obsessed with all that. And then my mum was going through the yellow pages looking for somebody who would teach me. Going through every single one of them, none of them would teach a left-handed player. Why not? Really? Just another form of racism. <laughs> and, um, I love that gag, man. And so, yeah, except for this one guy in South Emsel called Jeff Swift, who proceeded to take me on, mm. was dazzled at how incredible I'd done teaching myself for a year. So dazzled, he proceeded to marry my mother. <laughs> <laughs> That's above and beyond the call of duty, isn't it? I think that's a little step yeah. too far, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. he's, actually, he, he's actually the reason that we met. Um, Indeed, I'm, that's it, right. Yeah. yeah, I. It's the first ev- It's the first year I started Monty's actually, and like the, the doing the pickups and side of things. I went to Birmingham Guitar Show, and I had like the corner of another guy's stand. Literally, it was just me with this little sort of pillar of guitars, and we got. He, he came up and he was just talking about guitars and stuff. And I was working on two guitars for for Biffy at the time. Right. Relent, Relentless, the energy drink. I've, I've had a friend who used to work there and they were doing something. There was a They were at the time going to do something with Biffy or Brian. I can't remember what it was. Yeah. But we'd done that. But then, like, get, we couldn't we couldn't get hold of anybody there at Biffy. And then he said that he might be able to help and put me in touch with you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how that all started. And then yeah, made me that telly as well. You did which, indeed, which I still absolutely adore. It's very much a Biffy guitar. Mm. It's a, it's a rock machine. Yeah. Um, I love it. It fucking, it absolutely rips that guitar, man. I remember I when. It's just when oh, it's Black Chandelier came out, mm. and you guys. I think you texted me and said that you were doing some TV and you were going to use it. Mm. And I, I saw it was. I can't remember if it was like Jonathan Ross or something. Yeah, and, like and that. I wasn't on it. No, you, you could see. I was like literally. I was there like this at the telly. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> you could see it. You could see you in the sort of this outline. Right. And I remember. I remember putting on. I was like so excited i put on like my facebook thing back then it's like i just saw a bit the, the mike's using the guitar on 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 telly and rah, 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 rah. it was yeah very exciting but then my mate who works at fender go it was like no i think you find we gave them all the guitars it's like no no that one i made that one <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. yeah i did get reprimanded by uh the tall manager like look can't really have any you know anything I don't know. I think there was some who ha but I, I think I, I think that they were just being cautious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's been no bother. Yeah, it's really it's it's fun. If it's, it's I think I get fucking like, carte blanche really because I'm left-handed and I, you know, God bless them. I love them so much, but there's only so many sunburst straps they can give me. So, <laughs> I have one of them sprayed pink. That's how desperate I am. Nice. For a not. Yes, very nice. Burgundy mist, man. Yes. Woo-hoo! Pink, pink guitar club. Pink axes, forever, man. I'm, I'm in the process of building a, a Eddie Van Halen style. Pink. Are you really? I. No, yeah, pink. It's like it's going to be pink with like this kind of turquoise, this kind of color. Oh, it's nice, nice, man. It's going to be cool. This obscenity. Oh, oh, look at that. I know. That's that's my roots right there. I've got a MIDI pickup on it now because it's a guitar it that I'll never be seen in public with. <laughs> what is that? that? Is it an Ibanez? Yeah. Yeah, Ibanez like RG550. I got it when I was like 16. Oh man, love it. I mean, you just breathe on it and it fucking plays. What you got there? Woo-hoo! This is. <laughs> Look at that. Oh man. 
Yeah. This is awesome though, because this has lost a fret inlay. They did such a bad job. I don't know whether oh you can my see God, it. Oh, look at they that. They did such a bad job of doing the fret inlays that it oh, actually fell out. Bring it in, <laughs> we can fill it, we can fill it with some pink resin. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming in, definitely. We're wicked. Yeah, this used to be black, and then I just wanted I thought, oh, I, I could inject some class into it by going bare woods, you know. Yeah. Um, I don't even know what this is. It's an Ibanez Korean, like, co it, it wasn't even an RG. It's like a... Uh, my first Ibanez. <laughs> it is, exactly. EX series, whatever that means. Yeah. And the, it, it's, a, it's a pretend Floyd Rose. It's an Ibanez... What is it? TR something trem. Under license Floyd Rose parts. And basically after a year, it just wouldn't come back in tune because the posts would all were all worn out oh but it's, it's like proper geek thing on that is that all of those the original floyd rose and the good ones are all solid metal but those cheap ones they've got like a solid hard outer core outer and then when it outer, wears away yeah. and then it wears away and the insides this horrible metal Jeez. So soft. <laughs> yeah so well, interestingly enough when i was about fucking 13 my dad bought me an Ibanez. Uh, it was a Roadster 2. Oh, those are cool. Which is the one that Michael J. Fox plays in Back to the Future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, kids, ah. you're just too darn loud. Huey Lewis, that yeah. bit, right? And fucking, I was, I had it at school and I was taking a piss <laughs> with it on my back and the fucking strap locks broke and the fucking Floyd Rose snapped in half. Oh, guitar dead, just gone. <laughs> so that is what I ripped the pickups out of and put in this piece of shit, which is my that's the original one. Oh, right? favorite guitar. It's uh, so th those are out of the Ibanez. That's a tone zone, yeah, uh, stinky old piece of shit. Squire yeah. from uh, 1984 or something. I got it in 87. That's, that's amazing. amazing. Oh, that's yeah. <laughs> Still yeah. the loudest guitar on earth. Because I couldn't. I, 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 around that point, I was like, man, when I get a Floyd Rose trem, I'm gonna take over the entire fucking planet. <laughs> I'm gonna be the greatest. But in, in the meantime, I had to get that. I got this piece of shit put on. Oh, like, Kayla. No, it's a fake Kayla from a Marlin <laughs> Sidewinder. Oh my lord. <laughs> Exactly. I, I put it, I immediately put it on and it immediately didn't work. Um, <laughs> so ever since then, it's just been locked down and it great. It's great. It makes it really resonant because it's just yeah. a ch chunk of fucking metal in there. That's wicked, man. Uh, all the good stuff. Yeah, um, that's cool. Fight. We always end the podcasts with a question, which is, well, it's two, two factors, really. So if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, is there anything in particular you would say? And also, what do you think your younger self would say to you now? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that was too heavy. Yeah. I, I, both versions of me would just tell me not to worry so much. Mm. Um, when I was a kid at school, I was terrified of not being liked. I just wanted to be popular. And I was also terrified of not being able to, um, I, I was just a major loser. I couldn't, I couldn't do shit at school. I didn't, I didn't care about football. I just wasn't clever at all. And I wanted to be liked a lot, but nobody in my school was into the things that I'm into. Not one person was into music of any description. And I see that exact same thing happening with my son now, who's eight. And I, you know, it's like, well, you know, those not having those things at that age only made me more determined to be in a, it just drove me further and further into music and further into my own head. And those things are what have informed every fucking thing I've done ever since. So in that respect, I'd just tell myself, it's all right, you got this, you know. Uh, a kid telling me now will probably be taking the piss out of me for being a total dick. <laughs> if I do that, 
plenty myself anyway. <laughs> In fact, I'll, tell, I'll tell you, at one point, uh, this is going back some years with Biffy. I, ju I just joined with Biffy. I was still trying to make a good impression, even though I knew him pretty well. And then one night after rehearsal, they were all going to go see Take That at Wembley Stadium, right? Mm -hmm. And they were like, you coming, you coming along? We've got your ticket. And I was like, yeah, yeah, cool. And I put one foot in the fucking car. And then the 14-year-old version of me whispered in my ear, go to see Take That, I yeah, I. <laughs> and then you go see fucking Take That. <laughs> and I was like... <laughs> I'm, like, I'm not gonna no fuck this shit I don't care about <laughs> that I hate them I still hate them <laughs> the 14 year old Iron Maiden fan would not let let it happen so I was like fuck you guys you're gonna enjoy that shit <laughs> <laughs> cool well that answered that very well <laughs> yeah, I got out of that one before it got too serious <laughs> <laughs> but man thank, thanks so much for um, coming on and having a chat. Thank it's, you guys. It's been great chat. Yeah, great, yeah. Great catching up with you. Yeah, I know. It's been a while. It's been once, a long time. Yeah, once all this crazy bullshit's over, it'd be cool to actually catch up in person. Yeah, <laughs> man, that'd be great. I'd like to think that'll be down there rehearsing at some point. We can uh, grab a cheeky pint. That would be Absolutely. Awesome. I'm up for that. Amazing. Wicked man. Right, well, I better nick off. All right. And appear all wise. Uh, Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Well, fellas, thanks so, so much. Cheers, man. Love. Cheers, man. And to you. Yeah, bye See now. ya. <laughs>